Whoa, whoa. What was any of that? What is going on everybody? It's Rigsu here back at it again with another NASCAR Pinty Series race review video for the 2022 season. It's race 9 of 13, the Grand Prix de Trois Rivières at GP3R this past Sunday. Yeah, can you believe that there are already four races remaining on the schedule? If you haven't yet, I highly recommend you go back and watch my sixth race review video going over the West Coast Swing Races in Edmonton and Saskatoon so you remain caught up on what has gone on so far this season. Also, if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell so you don't miss out on anything else. Alrighty then, there are a ton of headlines to get through in this one, both before the race, during the race, maybe even after the race, it's, it's all over the place. Those are pretty much the words we've heard after every single race this season, so I mean, it's not surprising, it's pretty much a, a repetitive pattern. Coming off a wild West Coast swing with two veterans scoring their first win of the season, Mark Antoine Cameron returned to the points lead despite the points penalty after Edmonton, with Kevin Lacroix and DJ Kennington close behind. On the entry list for Trois Rivières, many road course aces returned, and a couple of new faces even popped up as well. Let's go down the list in numerical order. Dominic St. Cyr makes a series debut in the number 3 car for Ed Hackinson Racing, coming in with experience from go-karts and superbikes, along with being an RV dealership co-owner. LP Dumoulin's older brother JF, who last raced in the series in 2021, at this exact track, which is also his home track, returns to the number 04 car hoping to improve upon his runner-up finish from last year. Well, would you look at that? A Formula 1 world champion and a participant in the 2021 Daytona 500 is in the field for this one. It's none other than Jacques Villeneuve, driving in a Dumoulin-owned car, which should be quite the headline. About that, though, any talk of him later will unfortunately be, well, just that. Unfortunate. Matthew Kingsbury, Louis-Philippe Montour, Simon Dionvien, and Alex Gannett all return to put on a show as the ultimate underdog road course ringers. Speaking of the latter and Alex Gannett, he will be quite the topic later in the video. The last new name to discuss is Serge Bordeaux in the number 55 car who I struggled with in my research, but it appears he has some relation to Kevin Lacroix's team. Maybe someone can fill me in on him, that would be appreciated if possible. In practice on Saturday, the Dumoulin brothers dominate the field with the younger one, aka the full-time one, scoring the top spot. The rest of the top 10 is relatively normal in a sense, although drivers such as Gannett, Sam Fellows, and Jacques Villeneuve are interesting to see towards the top. Speaking of Fellows, fun fact, his father, aka Canadian road racing legend, Ron Fellows, returned to racing over the weekend driving in a dirt modified at the exact same track. A few hours later in qualifying, Kevin Lacroix showed his superior circuit pace with a time of 106.947, beating Marc Antoine Cameron by 0.017 seconds. The Dumoulins remain smooth, Villeneuve scores 11th place again, and Brandon Watson improves to 14th after struggling in practice in I believe it was 21st. Okay, now it's time to analyze and discuss the LA 60 Tours Rousseau Metal. Well, this is going to be a long one. By the way, that race name I just tried to say a couple seconds ago there was the French version. I definitely completely failed it, but anyways, let's get into this. First of all, we don't even get started with the race. Nope, it's another case of Mother Nature being an absolute bit. It's funny too, because every other big North American motorsport that day had to deal with poor weather as well, specifically the NASCAR Cup Series and the NTT IndyCar Series. Ironically enough, the Pinty Series was the first one to get underway, as a lightning hold that was set was eventually lifted and the cars rolled onto the track after about an hour-long delay-ish. Sadly, one of the 26 cars did not roll out with the others, and go figure, it was Jacques Villeneuve's number 07 car. Things seemed to be working after a while of work, but he just could not complete a single lap and he had to quit the race. Such tragic circumstances in what could have been quite the race had he been able to actually race and, you know, compete up front. That's not to say the race didn't go well without him, though. <laughs> I laugh at myself when I say that. 
I will also mention that the field started on wet weather tires. That should definitely work out well with everyone. Lacroix and Cameron fought back and forth within the first five laps, and I believe it was on lap five when suddenly, coming through turn six, Lacroix's car slowed to a halt. And then behind him, Sam Fellows was turned by Alex Gannett. It doesn't end there, as Serge Bordeaux looks to have gotten loose beside TJ Rinomato heading into turn one, sending himself into that Quebec sign wall. Then, another newcomer, Dominic St. Cyr, locks up his front wheels in turn six, and he's in the tire barrier. Bordeaux and St. Cyr were done after these incidents. On the restart, with Cameron pitting under the yellow, his teammate Andrew Ranger and the Doomlins pulled away, with JF Doomlin catching up within a few laps and taking the lead for a while. Caution number two was for Glenn Styers and eventually Wallace Stacy, as the number zero car went around in turn nine, and then the number 66 car piled in to give both cars extensive front end damage. It hasn't been the best season for either driver, and with Oshwick and Speedway coming up next, Styers might have to hopefully find some luck with a popular finish at the dirt track that he owns. Cameron led the next restart, with Lacroix finding himself slowly moving up back to the front despite his earlier mechanical problems, and someone was apparently given a black flag. JF Dumoulin might have been it? No confirmation given, but we move on. Then, on lap 23, tragedy would strike Lacroix, as his new number 74 Napa Auto Parts car stopped in the turn 2 runoff area, and he climbed out with obvious frustration. An absolutely huge headline for the points, considering he was the leader heading into the weekend, literally by one point. And now he's for sure to draw many spots. Maybe. The older Dumoulin got what he needed in the yellow flag with under 20 laps remaining, as Kingsbury had stopped on track. For some reason, the red flag was displayed for a couple of minutes, no clue why, but anyways, not long after, restart with 15 laps remaining. This should go well. Can Gannett hold on to second as Clute gets together with the 27 of Andrew Ranger. Clute is bumped out of the way. Ranger goes to third. I'm going to do what's called a pro gamer move. Oh, and now Dumoulin comes through and a bump back from Clute on the back end of Ranger. Into the wall goes the GM Pie number 27 of Andrew Ranger. That definitely didn't go well. So, yeah, Clute actually does get revenge on a road course this year, at least that's what it looks like, except it's not Kevin Lacroix. Surprisingly, this incident didn't end Ranger's day, and he wasn't done with Clute just yet. That's like what, the third headline I've asked you to stay tuned for? Good lord. A restart with seven laps remaining, Cameron versus Gannett, with the Dumoulin brothers right behind. Everything seemed okay until literally as soon as the next lap began, as it appears Cameron got loose coming through the final turns, giving Gannett a run down the main straightaway. The number 96 GM Pie car didn't hold back in doing a Ross Chastain style block, hopefully you get that reference, somehow not wrecking himself, and JF Dumoulin took advantage by stealing second place. Cameron got somewhat of a distance over the next four cars as the battle for second place got extremely heated for about the next two laps or so. With some of the cameras apparently catching some drips of potential rain, JF's number 04 car found dominant pace with two to three laps remaining, slowly catching up to Cameron through every corner, and you know what? I'll just let you watch what happens as soon as Dumoulin catches Cameron because exactly what happened literally got me viral with a tweet on Twitter. Cameron wants to spoil this Dumoulin party. In the 96, a little bump in turn number nine. He gets to the inside. They'll bump again. The 04 into the wall. And back across, he takes out his brother. The Dumoulin cars crash together in turn number 10. And they will see the white flag this time by. So this may make this race a fit. No white flag. Caution is out. Have another look at how this all started. You saw the 96 get to the inside in turn number nine, the exit of turn nine. That's where we made contact as the 04 came back across his nose. Yeah, that's as crazy and hilariously stupid looking as it freaking looks and gets. <laughs> I'm still wondering to this very second what Cameron must have been thinking when all of that happened in front of him. <laughs> and to confirm, JF Dumoulin is not a popular man according to the tweet I made. 
Yeah, no crap reeks. LP Dumlin, on the other hand, was able to continue, although he didn't get to even cross the line at the checkered flag because his right rear tire had apparently come off, and I think he was stopped in like the final turns or something. No clue specifically, but yeah, that's what happened. And there's probably some sibling fiasco now going on, maybe. <laughs> Anyways, overtime restart, Gannett, Cameron, Alex Tegliani, DJ Kennington, and JP Bergeron. The same pattern continues here. You watch the finish. Of 20 of the air in the NASCAR Pinty Series. The green flag waves once again, and we're back underway. Gannett clear, going into turn number one. He locks up. And problems on the 96 as he drags the chassis. So maybe a tire down for Mark Antoine Cameron. You saw sparks coming from underneath the GM Pia 96. A car to the wall in turn number two. And it's Ranger and Gary Clute again. These two cars have been connected by crazy glue. Gannett had cooked it hard in a turn number one, but it looks like a tire might be going down on the 96. Can Cameron hold on for second? Turn 10 is the right-hander that Cameron will have problems with. Gannett is all by himself, though. This is a battle for second. Gannett off of 11. He'll win his first in the Grand Prix of 20 Vier. DJ Kennington will cross the stripe in second. Mark Antoine Cameron will hold on to third. What a race. <laughs> Big congratulations from DJ Kennington. Gannett has run a long time. Hangs on to the checkered flag and now he lights it up. This is the burn down that we thought was gonna come with the first victory lap from the 39 of Alex Gannett. Alex Gannett is a NASCAR Pinty Series winner. What an ending. 30 races, a combined 16 through 2013 and 2014, 3 in 2019, all 10 in 2021, and also this year's Toronto Grand Prix. And now he's a NASCAR Pinty Series winner. What a story. Once again, another fantastic race at Trois Rivières. It can't get any better than this. By the way, if you come from my t viral tweet where literally someone said, like, this is casual Pinty Series racing, you need to watch the races instead of just looking at the occasional highlight videos that go around. Just saying. Looking at the results? Yes, sir. Alex Gannett. Kennington prevails with a fair runner-up finish after being mostly stuck outside the top five throughout most of the race. Cameron scores a podium position despite all of the anarchy that he was around. Tagliani keeps it clean in fourth, and Trayton Lapsevich scores a decent fifth. How about the rest of the top 10 finishes though, eh? Like Fellows, Montour, Jackson, Court Mosh, and Reno Motto. And then there's Gary Clutz. <laughs> yeah, he was able to finish, I guess. Yeah. Does Clute have two rivals now? Is the Lacroix thing now a Ranger thing? Is what, What's going on? Comment below what you think. Maybe Gary will comment on his perspective again like he did in the most sport video, which, yeah, by the way, if my beliefs are wrong or dramatic again, then shit. Reportedly the new point standings, credit to Joseph Strickley, DJ Kennington takes the lead, Cameron remains close while laughing his ass off from what he witnessed on Sunday, and Lacroix falls two spots. I'm actually surprised that he only fell like two spots, but I mean, being 16 points back isn't too much of a cushion to rebound upon, although the Lacroix team better hope for no mechanical issues next week, or moving forward in general. Ranger's streak of podiums has come to an end, having four between Toronto and the West Coast swing. Ever since the season opener at Sunset, Trayton Lapsovich just hasn't been where most people would have expected him to be. As some people say, it's the good old sophomore slump. With four races remaining, the idea of a championship for the young Sir is very steep, being 30 points back, but there is still time for him to at least gain some spots in the points. Maybe something incredible happens within the next four races. Who knows? This season has already been pretty... action-filled. <laughs> Alrighty then, nine races down, four to go. Where do we head next? Oh, well, it's none other than a dirt tr... A dirt track? Pinty's cars on dirt? Huh? Yup, for the first time in series history, there will be Pinty's cars on dirt. 
It's been extremely long awaited, especially considering it was supposed to be in 2021, but COVID said nope, obviously, and it will be happening on a late Tuesday night. And also Monday night too, apparently. Another case of a weird spot on the schedule, but honestly, that's been a pattern throughout the season. I'm not complaining about it, it's just funny. Oshwicken Speedway is the name, and go figure, it's in the village of Oshwicken, Ontario. A 3 8 of a mile dirt short track built by none other than current Pinty Series driver Glenn Styers in 1994, it hosts weekly races with 360 sprint cars, crate sprint cars, thunder stocks, and mini stocks, and the track used to host the World of Outlaws for a 10 year span, with drivers such as Tony Stewart, Donnie Schatz, and Stuart Friesen scoring victories at the track. Speaking of Friesen, he will be competing in the race, alongside a couple of other current and former NASCAR drivers, including Christopher Bell, Ken Schrader, and Kenny Wallace. They will also be apparently racing on Monday night as well with the 17th annual Canadian Sprint Car Nationals, and a poster says there's going to be a quick wick NASCAR Pinty's Hot Lap Dash, which apparently that sounds like it's going to be a half hour long event for money if I recall correctly. Sounds interesting at least. But yeah, after multiple 10 lap qualifying races a few hours before, it'll be a 100 lap feature with $25,000 on the line, and it should definitely be a big headline this week. It's hard to say out of all the full time drivers who will do the best, besides maybe the normal ones we see at the top, but does someone come in and surprise everyone? Will we see a true challenge between the NASCAR stars and the Pinty Series drivers? You can find out by tuning in once again if you can, whether it's on tsn.ca, the TSN app, or Flow Racing, which all do require subscription by the way, and continue to show your support for the NASCAR Pinty Series in whatever way you choose to do so. So, that's going to do it for this one. You got any thoughts? Leave them in the comments below. And if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe and give this a thumbs up. My name is Reegzer, or Reeks for short, and thank you for watching. Have a good one.